Hello and welcome back to goldstocktrades.com. Today we have a returning guest with us, Ken Collison. Ken is Chief Operating Officer of UCOR Rare Metals, which can be traded as UCU on the TSX Venture, and it also can be traded as UURAF on the OTCQX. Thanks, Ken, for being here with us today. Yeah, thanks for inviting me, Jeb. UCOR has had an exciting year, uh, especially late in late 2014, uh, you announced the use of molecular recognition technology. Talk to us about this technology and how it can be incorporated into the rare earth sector. Okay, uh, MRT has uh, been in use for oh, quite some time. It was invented in the 80s. Uh, the fellow that invented it uh, won the Nobel Prize for the technology. And then Reed Isaac uh, formed IBC, Advanced Technologies out of Utah. And they took this technology and adapted it to uh, recovering metals. And they've been doing this for about 20 years. And they've been doing it for things like bismuth, platinum, palladium, various metals. They've never done it for rare earths. So we approached them a couple of years ago and uh, sent them some pregnant solution. And since then, they've developed the ligands that are required uh, to separate rare earths out of a pregnant solution. And what a ligand is is an altered molecule that attracts only one other molecule. So for example, they developed a ligand uh, for dysprosium. So when you put a pregnant solution through a column filled with beads coated with the ligand, which they call a super lig, it attracts only the dysprosium molecule. And so they've developed ligands for all of our earths plus scandium. And they've run this through their lab and recovered all these and produced over 99.99% purity and recovered over 99% of the rare earth. And so they've produced the full range of rare earths plus they've produced scandium. Um, you know, like I said, these guys have been doing it for 20 years uh, and this is what they do. They develop a ligand in the lab and then they uh, test it to make sure that it works the way they expect it to. And then they coat either a plastic or a silica bead with it and fill a column and uh, they have a commercial venture. And they've scaled this up. I saw one they, they built for business and uh, in Amarillo, Texas, where Asarco has a large copper refinery there. It's been in existence for decades. And copper refineries don't like business. And so they've been taking the business out with ion exchange. And about five years ago, they replaced that with two MRT columns. Now, they wouldn't do that. You know, they got a refinery that's been working well for decades uh, using ion exchange. They're not going to replace it with something else unless they were, number one, sure it was going to work, and number two, that it was cheaper. And so when I was there, I talked to the operators, and, and uh, you know, they love it. Uh, the, the computer runs the, the unit. They replaced a pretty good-sized ion exchange circuit with two columns, two MRT columns, about five feet in diameter and seven feet tall. So... IBC has been doing this for 20 years, and there's no reason that they can't scale up uh, a plant for rare earths, uh, the same as they've done for, like I say, platinum, palladium, business, and there's probably a couple others I don't know about. And so it's a proven technology that we've just adapted to rare earths. And rare earth processing is really the key to the game right now because a lot of those technologies... Uh, we sort of lost, you know, most of the productions, uh, 90 of the heavies have been coming out of China for the past 20 years. So talk to us about the significance of securing the rights to this technology for rare earth separation. Uh, that, that was a pretty significant announcement. Yeah, we've got the rights uh, for MRT, for rare earth separation, for recycling, and for tailings. And when you look at rare earths, um, to me, it's a real game changer. Uh, as people involved in the industry know, it's a standard of solvent extraction. Solvent extraction requires a huge plant. Uh, they're very expensive to buy and, or to build and to operate. And uh, they're not particularly environmentally friendly. The other thing is they get less than 90% recovery, where MRT gets over 99% recovery. So that gives us a real leg up on anybody that's processing rare earth concentrates uh, 
with solid extraction. So it's huge, uh, I think, as far as rare earth industry is concerned, and like I say, a real game changer. The other thing is, we have it for tailings. There's any number of mines out there that are either producing tailings or have tailings, and there's been people try to make money reprocessing tailings, but they've been using the same technology that we used uh, when they put the tailings there in the first place. And the people that ran those plants 30 and 40 years ago, uh, you know, they knew what they were doing. And so most people that have tried that haven't been successful. Now, if you go in there with a new technology, all of a sudden, uh, what was a, a pile of uh, waste that might have contained some mineral, uh, you can leach, as long as you can leach it and put it in solution, you recover over 99% of it. And so it opens up a huge field for UCOR as far as treating tailings or treating people's processed streams, whether that be to improve the recovery or to recover metals that are in that stream that they just never recovered before. So, Ken, what are the next steps for the investment community? What, what are the ways to de-risk uh, this new technology? What are the next steps to advance it so that we can see that it will work on the commercial level? Well, part of our agreement with IBC is that they produce what we're calling a mini plant. And what this will be is a basically a smaller replica of a commercial plant. It'll be fully automated as the commercial plants are. And that will allow us to take, oh, you know, Bocan, pregnant solution from Bocan, or concentrate samples from other properties, uh, put them back in solution, and run it through our plant and produce. Uh, the individual where it concentrates. The other thing it'll do is allow people to uh, come and see it and touch it. People in the mining industry tend to be a bit of a skeptics. And so this will give them an opportunity to come down, uh, see this plant operate, and actually see their pregnant solution or somebody else's pregnant solution go in the front end and see the earth concentrates come out the back end. And that, to me, uh, is sort of the proof of the pudding. Uh, but like I say, uh, this is nothing new for IBC. They've been scaling these things up for 20 years. Ken, in 2015, in the beginning of the year, January, you announced that uh, the, the bulk and mineralization, uh, the high-grade heavy rare earth mineralization extends at depth. You also uh, announced that you completed uh, the drilling in 2014. Talk to about us about the significance of the Bokan mineralization, what you found this drilling program and what it's leading up to? All right, last summer we spent about two and a half million dollars uh, doing infill drilling and also drilling some holes of depth, as you mentioned. Um, for our PEA, we needed an inferred resource for our feasibility study. We need an indicated resource that can be taken into a measured, uh, proven and probable uh, ore reserve when we do the study. And so we had to do infill drilling. Um, and at the same time, we drilled well, four or five, I guess five holes deeper than the original resource was. All these holes, you know, we didn't get any rude surprises. Uh, we're waiting to get the new resource. It should be out very, very shortly. Um, but see, seeing that the ore body continues at depth certainly wasn't a surprise for any of us uh, that have a geological background or a mining background because of the type of ore body it is. But it's still reason we did it was to prove to people that that is correct, and also it'll increase our resource. And these holes, uh, some of them were about 100 meters below the bottom of the existing resource, and the existing resource went down 250 meters. And so, you know, it's pretty significant when you can, you know, go half again as deep as what your original resource was. So, Ken, you spend a lot of time up in Alaska. Talk to us about how having this asset in Alaska is such an advantage uh, in the rare earth sector? Alaska is just a great place to do business, uh, and not just because the fishing's good. Um, you know, they, they realize that their economy depends upon uh, natural resources, particularly oil out of Prudhoe Bay, but also they've got some pretty successful mines in Red Dog, Greens Creek, Kensington. There's a number of them, Fort Knox. And so they're very, very supportive, both politically and financially. And so we've got a really good support federally. Uh, Senator Murkowski, who's chairperson of the Energy and Natural Resource Committee, is from Ketchikan. 
Um, you know, and on a statewide basis, uh, we had a bill go through last session uh, to, and it was approved unanimously, but both in the Senate and the House by both Democrats and Republicans, that authorized ADA, which is a a agency of the government that promotes industrial development in the state, and it authorized them to finance up to 145 million dollars worth of our capital costs. They'll finance three quarters of all the costs of service facilities. And so they are a very, very resource-friendly uh, area to work in. Um, the local people, both uh, and the Alaska Natives as well on Prince of Wales, are very supportive. And so it's just a great place to do business. Can... It gives, I should add, this mm-hmm. gives us a huge leg up on most of the other companies in that, uh, according to the PEA, we, our capital cost is $221 million, And... The state has said they'll finance up to 145 million of it, and so that that is a huge, big plus for us uh, when it comes time to, you know, finance the development of the project. Ken, you're an engineer. You've built a few mines. From a technical perspective, as we can conclude here, many of the rare earth stocks have fallen off in value, in market cap value, but Ucor remains and outperforms the sector. From a technical and fundamental standpoint, what, is, in your opinion, is the reason why? Well, first off, we've got a good ore body. You know, you can change a lot of things. The one thing you can't change is the, is the ore itself. You know, what you got is what you got. And this is a good ore body. It's in a very, as I mentioned just a minute ago, a very friendly environment um, that has, uh, you know, up to two-thirds of their capital costs guaranteed by the state. Um, but above and beyond that, I think it's a group of people uh, that, uh, you know, they're, they're very responsible and reliable, and management uh, is the name of the game. If you don't have the talent required to uh, carry out a project, it's going to fall on its face, and I've seen that numerous times. And so the reason I work for UCOR is because the people there uh, know what they're doing, they're good to work with, and I'm having a good time. And so, you know, the key to me with any, when you look at any company, yeah, you look at the economics, but you better take a good look at the management as well. And that's what I did before I joined UCOR, and I said, hey, this is going to be, number one, a good project, and number two, a good group to work with. And it certainly has turned out that way. Ken Collison, Chief Operating Officer of UCOR Rare Metals, which can be treated as UCU on the TSX Venture. And as UURAF on the OTCQX, thanks, Ken, for being here with us today. Yeah, thanks for the invitation, Jeff.